So with this shift of self-identification to identification of self as other, we have um, the development of sadness. You see, your average fish isn't going to weep salty tears if its babies get eaten. In fact, it might actually eat some of them because they're, you know, sardines make a really good breakfast snack. I can vouch for that. All that DHA, it's really good for the brain. Um, whereas an, a mammal is going to feel tremendous sadness and loss if it loses its, its, its baby or if it's separated from the pack or from the herd, right? And so this is coming much closer to human consciousness. It's coming up to, and of course, human consciousness includes that that we have this identification and this development of sadness and yearning and longing and belonging, right? It's all very different than your reptile, your average sort of dinosaur kind of consciousness. It doesn't really go there. This, I don't think it does. It's been a while since I was a dinosaur. So, <laughs> I hope. <laughs> Maybe not. Um, so, once you, so that's sort of like the, the, the next shift up in evolutionary terms. And you get to this human consciousness. And human consciousness is actually right in the middle. And that's because of how come it can incorporate everything. Because we've got unicellular consciousness, insectoid consciousness, reptilian consciousness, mammalian consciousness, human consciousness. And then above human consciousness, so to speak, you've got what I'm simply going to call angelic consciousness. This is just, you know, consciousness on a, of, of, of a higher order of things. Um, and then with angelic consciousness and archangelic consciousness and universal consciousness, you have these, this, this very, very higher, you know, higher level expression of altruistic love, um, which is you know, that sort of special hallmark of humans um, that seems to be even different than, than what you know, mammals are actually experiencing or expressing. Uh, and so the cervical spine starts to get into <clears throat> the human interrelationship to the spiritual realms. So just to define terms a little bit, I'm going to back up and talk about um, what I mean by the, the spiritual realm. So you've got a physical body. That much we often can all agree on. Um, you've got a chi body. Uh, it's chi body is this, this other layer of energies that kind of, um, can be measured in a lot of different spectra of the electromagnetic spectrum, right? You can, you can measure chi as electromagnetics, as magnetic fields around um, living bodies, as um, <coughs> electrical fields, as um, pure magnetic fields, as microwave emissions, as... Um, um, ultrasound emissions, as light emissions, photonic emissions. You can measure <clears throat> all of this energy going on around living bodies. You can do curling photography this, at this point, um, infrared radiations, and it's clearly coherent and moving around and doing stuff. It's just that our Western um, <clears throat> intellectual grasp of its meaning is not yet present. We don't have any, you know, there's no theories around this. And in fact, electrophysical medicine is probably at this point the most um, suppressed and ignored aspect of medicine that there is. It's even more suppressed than mind-body medicine. Mind-body medicine is starting to come out of the closet. You've got psychoneuroimmunology, you've got people working, you know, with Kabat-Zinn's kind of approach and the mindfulness approach in Kaiser Hospital. It's kind of awesome. But electrophysical medicine and the study of the chi, nah, that's still taboo. And so even though we can measure it in all these different spectra and all these different um, methods of measuring it, nobody's really examining carefully what it actually is. Well, hopefully they are somewhere. For the, for the Chinese, <clears throat> the, 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 this qi system is like an organizing template for the physical functioning of your body. That's one way of looking at it. Um, it's, um, it's an organizing template. The fact that Western thinking denies the qi is kind of bizarre and scary. It's kind of like North Korea having nuclear weapons. There's something wrong with that. Because the chi is an incredibly easily experienced phenomenon for a seven-year-old, for a six-year-old. I mean, you know, honestly, you can take grade school kids, you can teach them 20 minutes of qigong, and they all get, the, the, they all understand that they have chi, and they already knew it anyway, right? So the fact that we as a culture pretend it doesn't exist is something a bit scary about that. But anyway, that's probably the subject of another two days of 
conversation. <laughs> um, so anyway, you've got a physical body, you've got a chi body. You then have a mental body, which some people call the astral body, which you could also call the shen, if you want to use a Chinese term for it. Each of these bodies stands, as it were, at a 90 degree angle to each of the other bodies. You know how if you've got an ant crawling across a piece of paper and you stick your finger down there, effectively for the ant, your finger appeared out of nowhere, right? Out of another set of dimensions. Because the ant, from our point of view, is kind of operating on a two-dimensional plane. And then you stick your finger down there and it goes, whoa, what's that about? It, right? It's, that's, that's like the interrelationship between your physical body and your chi body. Your chi body interacts with and interrelates with your, your physical body, and yet it's actually in a separate set of dimensions. You can measure its presence in the physical, especially looking at all the different electromagnetic spectra, but trust me on this one, it actually exists in a different set of dimensions, mostly, with a certain degree of intersection with our three dimensions, right? The mental body does the same thing, except it's at a 90 degree angle, as it were, to the chi body making it almost the opposite of the physical body, hence the Cartesian duality of Western thinking for the last 50 or well, at least the last 1,200 years. Um, because the Shen body operates in another set of dimensions. Now, some people can see the Shen body. Yes, they're called clairvoyants, and they have these little shacks by the side of the road with big signs saying, palm reading, $12. <laughs> Some of them do. Some of them are better paid and more organized. But, but the ability to see energy, and therefore to see the Shen body and see the astral body as well as the Chi body, is not an unknown human experience. It's probably about, I don't know, one person in 20 that actually perceives auras, right? The thing about perceiving auras is you can train it and you can suppress it. And um, you can shut it down, too, neurologically. So if you play video games and you watch a lot of TV and you work on a computer screen, it's probably shut down already because of the, the blah, shit going into your eyes. Oops, excuse me. Language correction. Um, I'm trying not to swear because we're filming this. Um, it's hard for me, actually. Um, <laughs> so, and you can train people to see auras, and you can untrain them really easily. You can take a child that, you know, because here's the thing. When you were a little baby, before you saw letters and before you saw concepts, chair and, 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 and table and so on, you saw energy. Everybody does, I think. Uh, and then you go through enculturation, right? And you go through, it doesn't take, very, doesn't take much, just takes a little disapproval or a little denial or a little inappropriate, like, you know, you feel like you're not fitting in with the crowd and then it starts to shut down. And many children that are highly psychic, they want to shut it down because they know they're different and it's freaking them out, right? They don't, they don't have much support for it often. So, so this is a known human function. So that's the third, the third sort of energy body. That's your Shen body. Right? And then, but then you've got another one, which is your spiritual body, which just exists in another set of dimensions. It sits at 90 degrees to the Shen body, as it were. And that's just another whole set of, dimensions in which you manifest. Now the beauty of being a human is you're just showing up in all these all these realms, functioning actually, highly functioning in all these realms simultaneously, which is cool. Um, why did I start talking about that? I totally forgot actually. You were explaining what, what the spiritual meant. Oh yeah, yeah. So once you get up to the to the cervical spine, and actually also the second, at least fully the second half of the thoracic spine, you're dealing with the human interrelationship to, the, to these other bodies, the, these other more subtle you know, realms of understanding and experience. Hence, in Chinese medicine, we have the window of heaven points. And we will try to, I'll try to go through the window of heaven points a little bit and show their interrelationship to the cervical vertebrae and their significance in terms of a, an ordering of the seven energies and their significance in relation to the chakra system, which is an, a, an ordering of seven divisions of your Shen body, your astral body, and your, and your spiritual body. Um, yeah. So anyway, there you are. You've got, you've got, these, you've got these stages of your spine, these, these 
functional anatomical groupings of spinal vertebrae. Um, four coccygeal, five sacral, five lumbar, 12 um, thoracic, seven cervical. And they relate to the evolutionary process of sentient embodiment, which according to Tibetan Buddhists was a heck of a process that went on for a very long time and was very and, and with great like expertise delivered you to the point you're at now, where you have this rare jewel. You have this human body, which according to Tibetan Buddhist teachings, very very strongly, but also to all other basic, you know, all other religions really. This is an incredible opportunity, and it's a rare opportunity. With eight or nine billion people on the planet, you might not think it's that rare, but actually. To be embodied in a physical human body is a rare opportunity. And if we nuke ourselves, it'll be even rarer. Because <laughs> we'll all be doing cockroach again for a few billion years. Um, so this rare opportunity of a human body encodes within it the evolutionary ladder from the beginning of sentient embodiment at the unicellular level all the way up to human embodiment in a mammalian body that can encompass all of the lower levels and then also the angelic, archangelic, and universal consciousness levels of a human. So studying the spine then becomes kind of interesting, you know, because it's part of, it's sort of a map of human embodiment, human consciousness simultaneously. So I have been talking for plenty of time. So we're going to take a break, tea break, snack break, and when we come back, we're going to do some qigong. And um, then... I don't know what we'll do after that. Okay? Thanks, guys. Bye.